So with all this talk of Vampire Coast, I want to talk about one of the gods of the Empire Pantheon that comes up has been coming up a lot in the in the relevant releases and all of the uh, discussions of Vampire Coast, and it is Manon. So here is a little chart here of the primary gods of the Empire. You'll see Manon at the very top, but you'll see more uh, Mermidia, Renal, Daria, Shalaya, Sigmar, Tal, Ulrich, and Verena. And we've talked about some of these already. We've talked about more in our uh, discussions of the Knightly Orders. We've talked about Mermidia in discussions about Knightly Orders as well when we talked about the uh, Knights of the Blazing Sun. Renald is you know, the, the god of luck. I and mean, every time you play Total War Warhammer and you go to gamble on uh, your Winds of Magic, and it says Renald sh sh or smiles upon you if you win. And uh, the rest of these guys kind of all place a very heavy hand in the greater lore of the Empire. And we haven't really gone into the human pantheon. We've gone into the Akisla pantheon, a bit of the elf pantheon, and so on and so forth, as well as the chaos pantheon. But I want to talk about Manon and his kind of greater impact on the Warhammer world as a whole. As a whole. Because he is, of course, you know, he's the god of the seas, oceans, uh, the wasteland, and uh, more than just that, though, storms, um, fair tide, stuff like that. Everything that kind of pertains to anything nautical, that's really Manon's keepsake, you know? And uh, he's got this really cool emblem. It's like this, this kind of mini horned crown, uh, or I guess like a pronged crown. Almost looks like something out of, uh, out of um, a Little Mermaid crown for, for Poseidon. But he, I mean, he all, in all intents and purposes, he is the Poseidon of the Warhammer world. Um, and he, he is very. He's not necessarily a malicious or benevolent god he's very kind of capricious and he can be benevolent but at the same time he can his his mood can kind of turn like the tides right and he can immediately smash and dole out amazing amounts of punishment to a uh, unworthy worshiper or an enemy of the of the cult anything like that so the cult of manan itself is basically is very they almost kind of have like the trade market on lock <laughs> it, it, I'll, I'll explain that in a second but, you know, any kind of coastal region has some sort of shrine or some sort of temple, altar, anything like that dedicated to Manan. And as you go into any kind of coastal cities with a port, there's usually going to be some sort of temple to Manan itself. Now, the priests of Manan, this is where it gets a little interesting. These guys kind of plant themselves on every single trading vessel, any vessel of war, any major fleet, um, and for, for a tithe paid to the temple. And this is, of course, going to act almost like a secondary trading tithe to anyone who hopes to trade in or out of a port city. So the, the priests say, well, hey, you know, I'll sit on your boat and I'll make sure that it gets to its its birth, or I'm sorry, it gets to its destination from its birth um, safely. I'll pray to Manan the entire time. And if you don't have me there, though, and you don't pray to Manan, then I don't know what's going to happen. You might you might come up across a whole entire slew of squalls that you just your ship can't recover from. So it's this kind of uh, very, very interesting relationship because Manan himself is very fickle. He, he, like I said, he doles out punishment to anyone who doesn't really kind of pay their respects to him. And the, the sea, as we see, is a large portion of the Warhammer world. And he has that kind of ultimate control. So it's very, very interesting. And the cult of Manan is primarily worshipped in the Empire, of course. It, it is an Empire, an Imperial Pantheon God member, or Pantheon member, God, and chiefly in Marienburg itself. And this is this is, should not come as any surprise to anyone, because Marienburg is this massive port city. It kind of it kind of rely it kind of lies or kind of is placed at the end of the of the Reich, the the river that runs right next to the Altdorf and then kind of deltas off into the middle of the rest of the empire and this controls so much trade in and out of the empire the marienburg does sit in the in what's called the westlands that is away from uh the reich and, and from altdorf and at the same time they're not a part of the sovereign nation of the old world of the empire they kind of have a very interesting kind of like democracy where uh, everyone kind of uh, the, the saying kind of is that okay Everyone will take care of themselves. Everyone will have a say in things, and everything's just going to be fine. Uh, unfortunately, Marienburg is actually ruled by kind of like the the wealthiest elite. They kind of control everything. Uh, but in in that is included the High Temple of, of Manan, and this is again the chief most location of Manan's worship. I mean, throughout the rest of the empire, 
it's not as well recognized because it's not, uh, the rest of the empire is pretty much landlocked, but of course across the Reich and in Altdorf you have a lot of temples of Manan. You actually have a lot of temples over in Ostland, which actually has connections over to the northern portions of the coast of the empire where there is again, more temples and altars to Manan. And there's a very particular story in the lore about how there's a giant chaos incursion kind of sweeping through the empire, right? And they start, they stop dead at Ostland because of a, a temple of Manan at Salkotten that it basically this giant storm and tempest kind of is summoned up and it, and it batters the invasion invasion away from Ostland. It's kind of this really cool um, display of Manan's kind of miracles and his power uh, by defending his own worshippers. Majority of his worshippers are out on the sea, so it's like, okay, well, my defense of them is I'm not going to throw a squall their way. But this is one of the few times where Manan actually comes onto land or, you know, extension of land to help out his, his worshippers, his followers. And it's interesting how Manan is kind of spread across the rest of the world. There, there are many subcults of Manan throughout the empire, even himself. Like if you were just simply a fisherman and you wanted to say, okay, I want a more bountiful crop, I don't want to say crop, but more bountiful harvest from my fishing, you would worship the cult of Manalt, which is a subcult of Manan. Even then, there's another one called uh, Manhavik, which is one that's actually created in the central Stirland, which is actually landlocked in higher, entirely. They're considered an ancient sect of uh, the cult of Manan that kind of worships these ancient, ancient tenants that are the true, what they feel is the true tenants of Manan, waiting for basically the end times, quote unquote, when Manan will wipe the, the, the land see or the land clear with a purifying wave type of thing. It's kind of very, they're very more, uh, much more doom, doomsayers. Now, there's also Mothlon, who is a elf pantheon member. And it's, it is actually argued that Mothlon and Manan are the exact same deity. Uh, just like a, a number of other deities in the Emperor Pantheon are actually rumored to be elf pantheon members. Like Cain is rumored to be another member of the, uh, of the human pantheon. I actually can't remember who it is off the top of my head. Um... You can look at the list. And yeah, I, I can't remember. Something's striking my brain. But um, there, are, there are multiple times that this happens. So what this might kind of look like in Total War Warhammer 2 with the Vampire Coast is we might see something interesting with Manam. We talked about the Murworm and how the Murworm is mentioned in portions of the High Elf 8th Edition book. So maybe this whole thing will kind of come around with Manan and Mothlon and how they'll somehow be kind of somewhere distantly connected. And the only real enemy that Manan has is Stromfels, the cult of Stromfels itself. And Stromfels is a, uh, a much different cult, and we're going to talk about them in their own video next after this, but I don't want to get too ahead of myself. So we've got, of course, the cult of Manan, and the cult of Manan does also has its own knightly orders, right? Orders that are derived from the orders, uh, the Templar orders of the Empire, the Knights Mariner, orders of the Albatross, the Sons of Manan, the Storm Guard. Each one of these kind of owes their allegiance to Manan. They pay their tithes to Manan and prayers and whatnot. And the kind of uh, the strictures of, of Manan are, are very interesting as well. They have these, these sets of rules. And there's a lot of like kind of signs of, of good omen and bad omen. And they play very handedly into the typical signs that we see for mariners, right? Uh, one of the signs of a good omen is when you see a not, a, not a dove, but a seagull, which is if you're on ocean, on the ocean, you know that that's a sign of land, land ho, and that is a, a positive sign in the in the cult of Manan. And uh, subsequently, if you see a if an albatross drops dead on the deck of your ship, that's a bad omen, and that is again a bad omen that repeats itself in some of the old kind of age of sail that we see with uh, sailors, pirates, and stuff like that. Now, oh God, that's a dead albatross, it, the worst omen, and how that's all superstitious. But here's some of the strictures of Manan: um, obey your captain. Like a, obvious. It is forbidden to kill an albatross. We just talked about how albatross being a, a dead albatross is a bad omen. Do not whistle aboard a ship or within a temple. And that's actually a, an interesting notion there. Uh, whistling was to dictate the sails, which ones were supposed to be open, if they were half sail, full sail, quarter sail, um, which sails um, according to which mast, the front, the, uh, uh, the main mast, uh, the mizzen mast, all sorts of, of the top sail, uh, these whistles would dictate what 
um, uh, what the hell is the thing I just called? Uh, what a uh, uh, sail was going to go up and down. It would detect uh, different moves. The same thing is done in any, and this is a, an aside, but the same thing is done on any time you go into a theater. If you're working backstage in a theater, you're not allowed to whistle because a whistle, um, anytime the, the old time theaters, like in, uh, not the globe, but again, let's just say the globe, uh, Shakespeare's globe for, for sake of argument to put you guys in that, that era. Um, the people that would, that would run, um, the rigging on ships would often, when, when it was off season for them, they would go and work at theaters and they would use the same whistling system to dictate what scenes to change. So you're not allowed to whistle on a ship backstage in a, in a, in a, in a, what the hell is it called? In a production or in a temple. Uh, whistle gently when sailing on a ship for it ensures a good headwind. Do not embark on a voyage on the 13th day. 13, a very uh, proverbial bad, bad luck day. <laughs> Nails and hair must not be cut at sea. They are an offering unworthy of Manon. Do not look back to port once you have departed. Do not throw stones at a ship or into the sea. Do not say the word drowned whilst at sea. Should you fall overboard, give Manon gold and he will spare you. Wine poured over the deck of a ship will bring good luck. Wine poured overboard will bring ill fortune. Wine poured over the deck of... Oh, over the deck of a ship. Okay. I thought they were saying like, oh, poured over. Um, the first fit fish caught every, each day must be thrown back as an offering to Manon. A cat on board a ship brings good luck. A cat on board a ship brings bad luck. <laughs> a woman on board brings bad luck. That's, again, a very uh, typical kind of maritime... Thing we hear for bad luck. A naked woman aboard a ship calms the sea, hence why so many ships have figureheads in the form of naked women. Uh, a silver coin placed under the mast ensures good luck. A silver coin thrown in the, into the sea brings death. A gold coin thrown into the sea pleases Manon. A goat hung from the mast of a ship ensures a safe voyage. A beastman hung from the mast of a ship ensures a safe voyage. And do not tolerate the worship of the shark god that Stromfels. And uh, we'll, we'll go into... Uh, how that uh, how that really works out with Schrompels, but um, a lot of really cool things with uh, Manon himself, and Manon has his own kind of lore attached to him. That kind of you know the, the certain blessings and certain kind of attacks that would kind of hint towards well not hint towards, but have a lot of uh, nautical terminology. You know, breath of water, curse of the albatross, drowned man's face, fair wind, fisherman's eyes, stuff like that. And uh, this is all from the Warhammer Fantasy RPG Second Edition. So if you're wondering a lot more about that, you could dive deeper on um, what each one of these little uh, divine the divine lore of Manon does and how they have the pet, certain petty spells. But again, mainly they're they're based off of like blessing, um, giving an additional wind if the, if a ship is at sea in the in the lore in the RP, in an RPG you're playing stuff like that. The majority of the divine lores uh, have benefits for not for like armies because it's an RPG, so they're meant for more individual situ situ uh, situations and circumstances. But I hope you guys enjoyed this little video here on Manon and got a little better of an idea of, of who this god is that they keep talking about when they talk about the Vampire Coast and they talk about Ernest Assault Spite being possibly a daughter of Manon. So, you know, don't think of Manon as this kind of benevolent empire god. Think of him, again, in the, in the Grecian sense of Poseidon, who is a very fickle god, a very benevolent, merciful, but also very tempestuous and very wrathful god. You have to think of him in all these strokes because he is kind of, he, he uh, ebbs and flows just like the current. But thanks so much for watching here today, guys. Don't forget to like, comment below. Let me know about some of the other gods you want to hear more about. Our next video for the gods will be about Stromfels. So we'll talk about the, the shark god himself and how he kind of has, it has to do with any calamity at sea. It's really big on, uh, it's really big a part of his pantheon. But as always, guys, have a good one and take care.